Toda. <laughs> and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you uh, to Vegan Friendly for bringing me here. Thank you for Vegan Healthy. Thank you for Vegan Loving. Thank you for Vegan Amazing. Thank you for Vegan Awesome. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to start this uh, presentation with an apology. And I'd like to apologize on behalf of every doctor you ever saw <laughs> who tried to figure out what was wrong with you and make recommendations without ever asking you what you eat. This is a glaring, appalling, embarrassing feature of modern medicine, certainly rampant in American medicine. And I imagine Israeli medicine is similar, though I have great respect for Israeli physicians. You guys are smart and, uh, and are leaders in your field in so many dimensions. Uh, but I have a feeling uh, that Nutrition is not high in the priority uh, during medical education in Israel either. Could I have my presenter view here? Could I? Yeah, okay. So this lecture is uh, what I wish I had learned in medical school about nutrition, because it's the key to understanding health. It's the understanding <laughs> the understanding of disease. If not. And not the key to understanding MacBook Pros and presenter modes, but uh, we're trying to get there. Doesn't matter. On we go. So I'm spending. I've been a physician for 47 years. I became vegan in 1981, 38 years ago, because. Back then, back then there was no vegan friendly. People weren't very friendly to vegans at all back then. Still aren't in many places. But there was the human body that needs to run on plants. There were the animals and there was the truth. And those three left me no choice but to become vegan because I had to look myself in the mirror every morning and I had to, and I, knew, I grew up on my uncle's dairy farm in Wisconsin and I know the cruelty involved in putting meat and dairy on the table and uh, there was no place else to go uh, but a life of harmlessness and benevolence and that leads you to being vegan. But after these 30, after these 47 years in medicine, I realized that to practice medicine without taking into account what our patients are eating uh, is trying to drive a car with, uh, with three wheels, two wheels. It doesn't go. So I'm spending the rest of my medical career working for our nonprofit initiative called Moving Medicine Forward. And I'm going around to the medical schools and I'm talking to the medical students before pharmacosclerosis sets into their brains, and where they think that a drug is the cause and treatment for, uh, for all maladies. And I'm delivering a simple message, and it's here. So I tell these young first, second, third, fourth year medical students, listen, you are learning how to diagnose and treat all sorts of weird and wonderful diseases from smallpox to leprosy. But when you open that door, and your general practice urge, uh, waiting room, you open the waiting room door in the emergency department, in the surgical outpatient clinic, you're not gonna be seeing people with smallpox and leprosy. What you're gonna be seeing is a large group of people with a small group of grim diseases like these. Their arteries are all clogged up with atherosclerotic plaques, their blood pressure is up, their lipids are over the moon, their insulin receptors are all caught up with fat, so they've got type 2 diabetes. More and more of them have this dreadful, frightening dementia of Alzheimer's, 
rampant in this country, I know. And inflammation of every tissue in their body, their lungs are asthmatic, their joints are inflamed. This is modern Western medicine in the 21st century. Israel has its own particular varieties. The main causes of death, as in America, are clogged up of the heart. Alzheimer's is very rampant here. So is stroke. So cancers of the lung from smoking and of the colon, largely from packing that colon full of meat two, three times a day. Well, I'll be telling you more about that. Cancer of the breast, often re uh, related to dairy consumption among women. Uh, all the cows are pregnant and the milk is full of estrogens and stimulates the breast tissue and sets them up for breast lumps and breast cancers. Common diseases, slightly different causes here. The main causes are cancers, the lung and colon, and artery disease leading to heart attacks, strokes, and Alzheimer's. And so the main causes are cigarette smoking and what Israeli people are eating. When uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation looks at the actual causes, it comes out, of course, high blood sugars tied in with diabetes, uh, tobacco, and th these are all food-related. Um, high, uh, high body mass index, high blood pressure, this is eating too much fat and salt, this is just eating too much. Uh, this is the dietary risk, whatever they are, you can bet it has to do with meat, dairy, oils, and flour products. Uh, air pollution uh, is hard on the lungs. And when you see kidney function, this is also a dietary disease. The two main toxins to the kidneys are high protein diets. Pro high protein diets are toxic to the kidneys. Those amino acids slam into the filter units, the glomeruli, and damage them. And our he man paleo friends are going to learn this one the hard way. And the, and the kidney is very well supplied with blood vessels from the big renal artery that goes into the kidney uh, to the myriad uh, uh, branches of the, uh, of the blood vessels in the, within the arteries, within the kidney. Uh, well, those arteries clog up with atherosclerosis as well. So the failing kidney uh, has damaged glomeruli from too much protein and clogged up arteries from uh, <clears throat> too much uh, atherosclerotic damage, both uh, dietary diseases. And then the fearsome Alzheimer's disease that everybody is afraid of. Um, so many of the factors, when you actually look at what causes them, uh, you see, uh, again, the brains of people with Alzheimer's are, the arteries are all caked up with atherosclerotic plaques. It's largely a blood vessel disease. Uh, and when you look at the, what those people are eating, they have diets high in saturated fats, uh, uh, cholesterol, uh, oxidative stress uh, comes from cooked animal proteins, uh, air pollution, etc. Too much sugar in the diet creates oxidizing uh, substances as well. Uh, the fat uh, makes these people insulin resistant uh, by clogging up the insulin receptors and the enzymes that handle sugars in the cells. Uh, inflammation is rampant throughout the bodies of everyone uh, suffering most of these diseases, but certainly in the Alzheimer's folks. They have excess levels of copper, mercury, lead, and cadmium in their tissues. These are found uh, in meat products. Uh, lack of folate uh, to help their brain uh, nerve tissue function. Uh, the problem is that uh, meat has no folate in it, uh, where plants have plenty of it. And uh, there's inflammation due to these advanced glycation end products. And I'll tell you what those are in a minute. But when people eat sugars, the sugars stick to the proteins. The body heat oxidizes them into these nasty um, uh, uh, oxidation products called AGEs, or advanced glycation end products. Uh, the brains of Alzheimer people are filled with these advanced glycation end products. Uh, and um, there is this amazing membrane, the blood-brain barrier, that keeps a lot of evil molecules out of your brain. Well, the Alzheimer folks uh, have damaged that membrane, so a lot of things in their diet winds up uh, going right to their brain tissue and causing damage. So there's, there's many causes to this condition, but so many of them um, are tied in with meat-based diets. <clears throat> The Israelis boast, I see on the internet, about their healthy, the world's healthiest diet. Um, we can discuss that over a cup of tea, 
but there's no question uh, that meat consumption here is world class. Uh, the Israelis uh, rank fifth, rank fifth uh, in meat consumption in the world. Um, they eat 80.3 kilograms per person per year. That's 176 pounds. They average about a half a pound a day. And uh, chicken uh, is, seems to be by far uh, the meat of choice. Uh, you can see meat consumption uh, in Israel uh, since the 60s here. Uh, beef consumption, slight uptick. You eat about 30 kilograms a year. Uh, but here's poultry consumption uh, that has really taken a skyrocket since the mid-90s. Uh, Israelis now produce 300,000 tons of chicken every year and 100,000 tons of turkeys. Uh, to, uh, when you do the mathematics, those are hundreds and hundreds of millions uh, of these lovely creatures uh, wind up on tables uh, in this country. <laughs> so let's talk about some nutritional realities. I wish somebody had told me this in medical school. It would have changed every diagnosis I made. It would change every treatment plan that I recommended. It's so important. And this, it's a basic truth that I'm going around telling the young medical students now the difference between plant-based diets and animal-based diets, the many, many fundamental differences. I tell them if, if you were to eat a whole food plant-based meal, if you were to have a nice big salad, a hearty bowl of vegetable bean soup, and uh, these are what, quinoa and uh, zucchini boats, and uh, nice steamed green yellow vegetables, you eat a meal like this. And if an hour later, I were to sneak up on you with a needle and a syringe in my hand, and when you weren't looking, I drew five cc's of blood into a glass tube and let it sit there for an hour, spun it down into a centrifuge. This is what it would look like. The red clot goes to the bottom, the liquid part of the blood, the serum rises up to the top. And the serum is crystal clear. You can read newsprint through normal serum. This is what your blood should look like after you eat a healthy, vegan, plant-based meal without, without a lot of processed junk in it, but real food that grew out of the ground. This is what your blood looks like, as, as every gorilla's blood, every antelope's blood looks like after they eat their meals as well. Uh, your blood should be nice and clear. But you eat a standard Western diet. You eat a meal, you have a bunch of eggs for breakfast, a big piece of pizza for lunch, uh, burgers, fries, and a shake, a steak for dinner, chicken for dinner, all the saturated fat in the burger, the butter fat and the cheese, the egg yolk and the mayonnaise, the vegetable oil and the fries, the, uh, the dairy fat in the milk shake. All this fat oozes out into the blood. And for the next five hours, your blood looks like this. This creamy appearance here, this is called lipemia, and the word means fat in the blood. That's what it means. Now, not everybody shows it this optically densely, but everybody has a wave of fat that goes through your bloodstream after you eat a fatty meal. How could you not? Where is it going to go? Of course, everybody's blood turns fatty after you eat a fatty meal. And I was serious about that five-hour number. <clears throat> Here's Kuo's classic study. And they gave someone a fatty meal at hour zero. And once an hour, they drew a, five cc's of blood and put those uh, for six hours. And they put those six blood tubes, one after another, into an instrument, a spectrophotometer, that measures how milky the blood is, how fatty it's getting. And you can see the blood getting fattier and fattier and fattier and fattier. It takes the liver a good five hours to begin to clear the fat out of the blood. Well, think of what that means in relation to how most Westerners, I, I don't know if all Israelis do this, but certainly most Americans certainly do, um, how they conduct their eating day. They start their morning off with something fatty, it turns their blood fatty, and for the next five hours, their blood is running thick with fat. And during that time, the inner lining of the artery walls, the endothelial lining is getting inflamed and uh, made more permeable. Uh, the fat sticks to their fat stores in their belly and they wind up more obese. Uh, the fat works its way into their muscle cells, their liver cells, clogs up their insulin receptor function and they get more insulin resistant. 
<laughs> and uh, in saturated fats, contrary to what the paleo folks are peddling, the saturated fats are good for you. Saturated fats set off inflammation. They are pro-inflammatory fats. And you send a big surge of saturated fat through your tissue. It ticks up your inflammatory reactions all over the body. This happens for a good five hours. It takes the liver till, <clears throat> until almost six hours, uh, till almost lunchtime, um, to clear the breakfast fat out of the blood, just in time for lunch, and send another wave of fat through the bloodstream. And all afternoon, the artery walls are getting injured, and the fat stores in the belly are increasing, and the insulin receptors are clogging up, and inflammation's uh, getting promoted. Takes the liver till about dinner time to clear the lunchtime fat out of the bloodstream, when time for dinner, and another wave of chicken fat goes to the bloodstream, or cow fat, or uh, any other types of animal fat, no pig fat here, uh, goes to the bloodstream. And the blood stays fatty all, after, all evening till it's time for dinner. I'm sorry, till it's time for dessert. And another wave of fat goes to the bloodstream on the way back to the bedroom. And the reality is that most people eating the Western diet are keeping their blood fatty all day. Stuff never clears out of the bloodstream. You keep your blood fatty for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Can't be surprised when some adverse changes start happening in your body. I will show you them in a minute. But lest you think, well, I, I, I don't eat that much fat, and I'm, not, and I'm pretty lean, uh, fat's not the problem. What I make very clear to the young medical students is that there's a lot more than fat in that blood. There is an evil brew of molecules that cause damage throughout the body. This is generally a high salt diet, a high sodium diet. Uh, the falafels and the hummus carry a good sodium charge. Certainly the cheese on the pizza and the french fries and all the snacks you find at the convenience stores are full of salt. The salt stiffens your artery walls, makes you retain fluid. That raises your blood pressure, which sets you up for strokes. But we're also finding out that the sodium in the salt is not benign stuff. Uh, it turns out it, it uh, turns on lymphocytes that trigger autoimmune diseases like lupus and ankylosing spondylitis. A high salt diets just are not healthy, and the standard Western diet is certainly full of that. Then we come to all the sugar that is found in the Western diet. Now let me make something clear here. We all love sweet foods. And it's okay to entertain the sweet taste buds on your tongue. Generally, the thing to tell you, of course, is that that's what fruit is for. The nature made it very easy to find. It's colorful. It hangs from trees, usually within reach. You can, you can usually find it without a problem. But I don't have any problem with a half a teaspoon of sugar in your tea because that's using sugar as it was meant to be used. It's a flavoring. It's a sweet flavoring. And a half teaspoon of sugar is not going to cause anybody any problem. What my advice to avoid is avoid eating sugar as a food. And that's what you're doing when you eat a cookie. Whoops, sorry. Getting used to the controls here. When you eat this cookie, you are eating a chunk of sugar as food. When you're eating a piece of cake, you're eating sugar as a food. You're eating sugar as a food. There's no under sugar as a food. Here you are drinking sugar food. You are flooding your tissues with hundreds of grams of sugar. This is toxic. How? Why? Because you know if you spill some syrup on the table, everything gets sticky. Well, the same thing happens in your body. Sugar sticks to proteins, and it sticks to proteins all over the body. We say it glycosylates the proteins. That's not a good thing in view of an important piece of chemistry called the Maillard reaction. What's that? Well, this is what makes bread brown. Uh, how do you make, uh, what makes this happen? The issue is combining sugar with protein and then heating it up. It happens in the bakery. The sugar is the pastry flour. The protein is the gluten. And they mix them together, put them in the, in the oven, and the Maillard reaction turns the bread brown, turns the cookies nice and solid and brown. 
wonderful thing to do on a French baguette. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction in your body. When you drink that cola, when you eat that candy bar, when you eat that donut, that cake, uh, that sugar as a food, the sugar floods through your tissues and it sticks to proteins all over your body, it sticks to your hemoglobin, it sticks to your collagen, it sticks to your myoglobin, your muscles. It glycosylates proteins all over your body and your body heat does what the baker's oven does and it turns the Maillard re uh, reaction on and you wind up creating this oxidized, bastardized, sugared protein mass uh, that just looks well, it looks like bread crust under the microscope. And the chemists call this result, um, they call, oops, call them advanced glycation end products, or AG, don't worry about the name so much, but the, na but the initial is A-G-E, it ages you is the problem. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction in, your, in the lens of your eye. It will set you up for cataracts. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction in the elastic fibers of your skin. It breaks them and makes your skin wrinkle. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction in the capillaries in your brain. This is the membrane that oxygen has to get across to fuel your nerve cells. With, uh, this is a good way um, to set yourself up for Alzheimer's dementia. Eating sugar as a food ages you, and that should be one of the take-homes from this talk. And if you need a little visual reminder that eating sugar as a food ages you, here is a lovely young woman about to do that act. She is about to eat a chunk of sugar as a food. She does so, and <clears throat> six months later, <laughs> mm -hmm. Eating sugar as a food ages you. It's a flavoring, don't eat it as a food. Which brings us around to our beloved vegan junk food. And you don't want to eat much of this stuff either. Um, now, I'm not totally against you know, veggie burgers and vegan hot dogs, and all this, especially if it helps our meat-eating friends transition to truly vegan diets. If the veggie burgers and the veggie dogs and the veggie everything helps them do that, wonderful. Uh, that's really their, their highest use. And for the rest of us who are already vegan, if, if once a month, twice a month, you want to treat yourself to a vegan pizza or a vegan veggie, you're fine. But don't be eating this stuff on, you know, many times during the week. Uh, it's, it's highly processed food and ultimately isn't uh, the best for you. Now, here's when I'm speaking to the medical students and to the medical residents. I get real with them about what the standard meat based diet does. They go, oh, you need meat for protein. And that's the end of their thinking about it. And I say, no, doctors. Here's the reality of what meat in the diet really does. And you need to know this, especially those of you promoting paleo diets and keto diets and other diets based on animal flesh. Here's the reality of what that does in the human body. First of all, nobody eats raw meat outside of the steak tartare fans. Uh, all meat is cooked, and the very act of cooking animal muscle oxidizes the cholesterol in every cell of the, uh, uh, of the meat, 